Ok, já vou conseguir transmitir. E direcionou para o YouTube. Ok, agora entrou. Entrou. Ok, Perfeito. já vou conseguir transmitir. Ok, Saulo, estamos ao vivo no YouTube. Perfeito. Uh, ok, agora não esquece é... de gravar, Thomas. É um live on YouTube. É. Yeah. Yeah. I'm admitting everyone in the room, so... Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 okay, Saulo. Um, Saulo, você está me ouvindo? Estou ouvindo. Ok, então a partir de agora eu acho que você pode ser o share, daqui a dois minutos é. e cinco minutos. So, hello everyone, uh, uh, we begin in two minutes, ok? Saulo will be sure. chatting today, uh, he's a professor of philosophy of law at the Federal University of Pará in Brazil and is a member of our research group. So, we are hi, waiting... Hi, hi, Jared. Uh, We are waiting for two more minutes because uh, more people are coming. Uh, but in any case, we are already broadcasting in YouTube. So I will come back in, in just one minute, okay? So we can start. Thank you. Um, so Brian, how are you surviving life in Minnesota? Oh, uh, pretty well. No snow yet. Probably give it another week or two before it starts. The, uh, the riots didn't reach your door then, huh? Uh, not even close. So my, my wife was worried that some, you know, some brushes we left out back would be used to burn down the, the, the palace, but it, it didn't happen. So. Yeah, well, yeah, they took care of the police station, right? So. Yeah, that was some distance away. How, Good. How about you? How's the, uh, how's the pandemic affecting you and yours? Well, uh, I, I moved out of Philadelphia last December. Talk about dumb luck. I mean, just, like, <laughs> yeah. just the absolute, the absolute, I, I got, you know, I got a place in New York and I just like, I don't need to live in two cities and Philadelphia is just screwed up beyond belief. So uh, I bought this, I bought a house in uh, Marion Station, which is right outside of Philly. It's great. You know, I got my gardeners here today. And, you know, things are wonderful. Uh, and then this thing hits and, it, and everybody wants to move here now. Right? Nobody wants to live in the city. So, uh, I mean, I go to New York. It's, uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, Midtown's a ghost town, I hear. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, compared to what it normally is, it's, it's mm. just crazy. Uh, you know, I can, I can get a restaurant reservation outside <laughs> almost anywhere. Uh, get a haircut. I'm going up Thursday to get a, a haircut, see my tailor. Well, what about what about Swansea and Surrey and all those other places? And well, you know, I mean, Florence. I haven't been to Swansea. I haven't been to Swansea for three years. You know, I got my gig at Surrey, and uh, you know, I actually want to go to London for three weeks, and I'm hoping to go. But I think I'm going to have to record my lectures this year. Yeah. No, I mean because well, you can room... spend the first two weeks just in your hotel room alone. Well, uh, oh, no, 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 come on. That stuff, that, that's not even enforced. That's not even enforced. And I have an Irish passport, so I just wave that and they go away. So, yeah. How do you have an Irish passport? I applied. <laughs> <laughs> from your, your Irish grandparents? Or? Exactly, exactly. I'm 100% Irish from the west of Ireland. Yeah. So you that's how I got Irish. it. That's so, how I got so. it from Connemara. So that helps me out a lot. I mean, that's how I, in Florence, I never had to go to get a visa or anything because I just had that. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's great to have an EU passport, especially now that- Discount uh, on Guinness? <laughs> exactly, Guinness, Guinness for breakfast, yeah. yeah. Thomas, your microphone is- 
Yes, um, I'm having trouble here because everybody wants to get in the room and they keep asking me. So perhaps Saulo should be the host. Yeah, I will put you as a host. But the problem, uh, I'm not sure if I am the host, you can, you can transmit the, the conference live on YouTube. Um, That's the should problem. we try? Yeah, yes, I, I think there is no problem, Saulo, because ah, okay. I always do I that. Okay, so from now on, Salo is the host. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, so you admit everyone. Okay, okay. nice. Um, and, uh, so we can, we can decide the order of the presentations now. Uh, uh, originally, uh, I thought that I would be the first and then Dennis and then Brian, but if you want to change, we can do that. I, I made a, a, long, a longer presentation, so perhaps uh, Brian and, and Dennis could go first. I, I changed a bit my talk. I can give you five quality minutes anytime you want it. Oh. Um, I defer to my colleague. Let Brian go first. OK, so Brian first. Uh, and, and I don't know if Dennis wants to speak before or after me, because I changed my presentation to respond to his paper. So would you like to go before me or, or, or after? I suggest the order, I suggest Bix, Patterson, Bustamante. That's my suggestion. Okay, and, and, then, then, and then Patterson again to, to reply to this last minute on unprepared salvo. Okay, <laughs> That's, that, that, that sounds perfect. Sure. Um, my, uh, so, so uh, Bix, nice. Patterson, and then Bustamante. That, that's the order of the presentations. Uh, Barbara uh, Levenbuch will not be able to join us today. She had a, a, a family problem, a family affair, and a home problem. So she just um, apologized. She said she would like to be here. If you want to see her paper, it will be published in the book. So. Uh, perhaps we can just show the book before the before we start the presentations, so we can uh, so you can see the uh, loss. You can see the the book that's going to be published. Philosophy um, of law. It's an integral. Um, okay. No, we can we can just start. Uh, oh, Saul, because I cannot find the this, the website to the book, so I, I will right. do it yeah. after we start working because I, I'm a little bit nervous here. So we can start, and um, Saul, from now on, you are the chair. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. So we have today our first seminar of the seminar series in law and philosophy. And today the seminar is, has the title Integrity and Protestant Interpretation. It's a special seminar uh, uh, due to the, to the publication of the book Philosophy of Law as an in integral part of philosophy. It says on, on the jurisprudence of Gerard Postema, who is here uh, in your room. Uh, and the book is organized by Professor Thomas Bustamante and Thiago De Ca. Uh, today we have three talks, I believe, yes. Uh, uh, the first one uh, is, will be made by Professor Brian Bix. Professor Brian Bix is professor for jurisprudence at the University of Minnesota. And after Professor Bix, we have Professor Dennis Patterson. Uh, who is professor at the University of Surrey. And finally, professor uh, Thomas Bustamante, professor for jurisprudence at Federal University of, of Minas Gerais. Uh, professor po Postema will, I believe, I, I'm not sure, but I believe professor Postema will uh, make some uh, commentaries about the, the, the talks. And, uh, I would say that this seminar series in law and philosophy is organized by different universities, University, Federal University of Minas Gerais, Federal University of Pará, uh, Catholic, uh, Pontificia University, uh, Catholic University of Minas Gerais, 
uh, University of São Paulo and Federal University of Paraná. Uh, Saulo, uh, before we start, can I show you the book? I found it. Okay, please. <laughs> uh, so you can um, host disabled participants screen share it. So if I take me, uh, you must uh, allow me to do that. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. What a moment. Um, how, how can I do this? Well, how you just share just click on me uh, uh, and there are three points and... I can do this, Thomas. I can find the book and... Okay, uh, but uh, okay, go ahead. Just uh, go on, carry on. Okay, let me try to find the book. I can post it on the chat and we can start because we, we don't want to lose more time. Yes. Yes, the book is on the only host can send messages. Everyone. <laughs> just, yeah. Sorry, let me. Um, Okay, I will find the book and I will write on the on the chat, okay? On the chat. Okay. Shall I start? Yes. Please. Okay, first I, I just wanna say, uh, um, my understanding is that the Professor uh, uh, Pasma isn't planning to, to give a talk unless we say something uh, directly against him as his writings or his immediate family, but we'll, so we'll do the best to provoke him into to response. Um, let me just say, um, I'm, I'm most grateful to, to uh, uh, Thomas Bustamante for inclusion uh, in the talk today and inclusion in, in the project. Um, uh, it, it's a great honor uh, to be part of, of this collection discussing uh, uh, Gerald Postuma's work. Uh, from my youngest days in legal philosophy, I've learned a great deal from him. And, and as he would point out, I still have a great deal to learn. So we, 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 we continue at it. Um, my paper and, 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 my, and the, my article in the book, the chapter in the book and, and my talk today was focused primarily on the idea of Protestant interpretation um, in Ronald Dworkin's work. Um, and Professor Posma's response to it, and, and also how it was discussed in the works of, of other scholars like Robert, Robert Cover and Sanford Levinson. Um, the idea of, of Protestant interpretation is a phrase uh, Dworkin uses a couple of times in his book, Law's Empire, and that um, Professors Postuma and Levinson then, then land on and, and emphasize in, in their critical remarks later. Uh, but you can find a similar idea going back to um, Ronald Dworkin's famous work, Taking Rights Seriously, um, a, a work that, that appeared, would then uh, later appear in a collection of the same name, but also you can still find it, uh, last time I checked, free online. It, it was published in New York Review of Books, and New York Review of Books uh, makes that article available. Um, and, and Dworkin's idea, Dworkin was in that time, was, was writing back in the early 1970s, maybe even late 1960s, I don't know, um, I think late early 70s, and he was talking about civil disobedience. Um, and one of his ideas was that, that, you know, the American Constitution has all of these rights, but the Supreme Court had interpreted them in a narrow way. And additionally, you know, so we might have constitutional rights differently from what the court says we has. And additionally, while the constitution may purport to be claiming all the moral rights individuals have against the state, there may well be other rights. And so the idea is that if officials take rights seriously, the phrase taking rights seriously, if they take rights seriously, they must be open to the possibility that individuals are exercising their rights, their legitimate moral or legal rights against the state, even if these go beyond or differ from the rights declared to under, under the US Constitution by the US Supreme Court. Um, 
And in some ways, it's a, it's a straightforward sort of point, a point that's been made by many scholars, both on the left and on the right, both in theoretical discussions and more practical discussions, that, the, that it's possible that the law is something different from what the courts say it is. You know, it's a standard move in the United States scholarship, at least for the last hundred years, and inspired by, by the American legal realist, amongst others, to say law is just what the courts say it is, or law is the prediction of what the courts would say it is. And, and Dworkin, in some ways, is taking the opposite and, and saying, you know, you may have a legal right even if the court says you don't. You may have a, a moral right even if the Constitution doesn't affirm it. And when we get to law's empire, Dworkin is saying the law is what it is even if no legal official agrees that every individual has as much claim to be interpreting what the what American law or British law or French law or whatever requires as a court, um, as a prosecutor, as an executive, as an administrator, right? And this is, and, and you, so you, you understand why Dworkin and, and later uh, uh, Apostema and, and, and Levinson and others talk about this as Protestant interpretation. It's like the idea that every individual is has as good a right as anyone else, as good a position as anyone else to interpret what the Bible requires, what, what God wants of, of us. Not that everyone's right. It's not, it's not a, a mass relativism. But it's an idea that at least in principle, um, officials can be wrong, courts can be wrong, and individuals have a, a, a power and an obligation to interpret what the law requires for themselves. Now, in Professor Postuma's 1987, wonderful little 1987 um, review of, of Law's Empire. Um, he criticizes the idea of Protestant interpretation in part by saying that it's too individualistic, um, that law is a common practice, a shared, a social practice, and that therefore its meaning is necessarily common and shared as well. In, in, in Professor Passama's uh, interview uh, in this same book, uh, the same collection that's, that's coming out soon by, by Hart Publishing, he emphasizes that, that you know, he now thinks that some of the things he wrote in, in around this time ab about um, social conventions and, uh, and about the critique of, of Dworkin, if anything, were, were not sufficiently focused on the social, that, that, it, that it's clear in Professor Possima's later work that, that we need to understand law as a social deliberative argumentative process, as, as a common practice practice, is it a common process? And therefore, the notion of the Herculean judge, Dworkin's phrase, the Herculean judge off in the corner coming up with his, her, its own speculative interpretation um, is misleading uh, in, in, in a certain sense, false. Um, and in my paper, I, I bring in, as, as I've already noted, I bring in Robert Cover and, and Sanford Levinson as well. Cover, um, who also emphasized in different ways the social aspect of legal interpretation. Um, famous, in a, a famous first sentence of, of the article, I'm not going to quote it here, I'm going to paraphrase, I guess I don't think I got it quite right, is legal interpretation takes place on a, on a plane of pain and death, right? L law, at least certainly the criminal law, and to some extent aspects of civil law is all about significant coercion, that it can lead to people being put in prison, and occasions people being executed, or at least people's property be taken away, people's liberty being taken away. Um, and because it's a matter of, can be a matter of significant coercion, um, law develops processes and rituals to try to overcome our natural resistance um, to coercing one another. Uh, and part of that is, you know, you know wigs and gowns and, and fancy Latin phrases, but part of it is also the notion that no significant legal penalty will ever be imposed simply on the will or whim of a single official. 
that if there's a trial court judge, that that decision on any significant matter will be subject to appeal and must be upheld on appeal. If it's on appeal already, all appellate court judges or multi-court judges, you need to have the agreement of one other judge on the panel at least. Um, and in any event, you must be able to communicate in clear language to the people who will put the punishment into effect, the, the, the officials, the sheriffs, the wardens must be able to understand. So the, the Herculean judge with the idiosyncratic interpretation who is not understood by anyone else cannot affect law. Levinson, Sanford Levinson's point was slightly different, picking up on the Protestant side that, that as he pointed out that ours and indeed most legal systems are not ultimately matters of Protestant interpretation, but if you're going to follow this religious analogy, they're more Catholic than Protestant. Right, that we have um, the equivalent of the Pope, the equivalent of, of the, ultimate, the ultimate source of what the law means. Um, this, you know, when a majority of a Supreme Court says that this is what the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution means, then that is what it means, right? That's what it means at least until the majority of the court decides otherwise. As, as, as Justice Jackson famously said about the court, we're not final because we're infallible, we're infallible because we're final. We, the law is what the court says it is. And, and Levinson has many interesting discussions based on this. And one of the points he was making was against Owen Fiss, and indeed, as he said, against himself and against most American professors. Most American professors then as now, as Levinson points out, then as now, disagree with the Supreme Court, then as now are significantly to the left of the Supreme Court. And, and I, when I teach constitutional law, when, when Levinson teaches constitutional law, when most American professors teach constitutional law, we spent a lot of time saying, oh, look, another horrible decision by the Supreme Court about the freedom of speech, about freedom of religion, about the 14th Amendment, about the 11th Amendment, uh, and every, about the 8th Amendment. All these, you know, look at all the things are getting wrong. And what Levinson says is that at some point in time, this is incoherent. That if we understand that we live in a system where the law is to some extent what a, a, a settled majority of the Supreme Court says it is, then it is incoherent to say that that settled majority is wrong. Now, I spent some time in the chapter, you know, adding some nuance and complication to it because it's not quite the final word and as Levinson realizes and, and, and others as well that the Supreme Court does sometime change its mind as, a, as they've done on, on the right to carry guns as they've done on same-sex marriage as they did some decades ago on, on saluting the flag etc and when they do change their mind they said well you know now we're right and and this is was the right answer all along and that complicates the matter but ultimately and primarily we are a Catholic interpretation legal system, not a Protestant interpretation legal system. And, and so, you know, this complicates questions about legal truth because, it, I mean, Dworkin's, Dworkin's aspect of it is still partly correct. There is a, a sense in which, you know, the, when the court changes its mind, it says, well, the law was this way all along. It's partly a matter of Fester Postuma's appropriate insistence that this, that law, certainly in the American legal system, is a matter of common discourse, common interpretation, and deliberation. And, you know, as, as he's, as Professor Postuma says in his interview, he has, you know, he has been honing this argument until his, even his most recent articles, I assume, in, including the next one, when the one after that. Um, this is a difficult argument to get across. I mean, you know, as, as Professor Passon will point out, you know, there's aspects of it in Wittgenstein, there's aspects of it uh, in Richard Brandom, um, in John Searle and Michael Bratman, uh, excuse me, Robert Brandom, my, my apologies. Um, the way to understand the social nature of understanding, the social nature of deliberation is not easy. We are, we are perhaps more in the United States than elsewhere, naturally individualistic people. But I think Professor Postma is right and Professor Patterson is right to insist on the social nature and to try to find a way to incorporate it in the way we talk about 
law and talk about legal reasoning, talk about legal interpretation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dix. Uh, so Thomas, uh, should I give the, the word to, to the next professor or we, we have discussion about this point? Yeah, perhaps we, uh, we can give just the word to Dennis and then we can make okay. just a round of questions in the end. Okay. Perfect. So then Professor Patterson, please. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I want to say something about, uh, about Jerry Passimo, a man I've known for a very long time. And, uh, you know, in this business, there are at least two kinds of people. The first kind suck all the air out of the room. And the second kind, they bring fresh air. And Jerry is, of course, of the second kind. He not only does that, He's one of the most careful listeners that I've ever met. You know, when I was, when I was starting out in this business, um, I had a lot of interaction with Jerry and I learned a lot from him. And he was always kind and thoughtful in his uh, uh, interactions with me and I benefited greatly. He is an absolute model for an academic. He's certainly a model for a human being but uh, we don't get a lot of those in academia. But in terms of uh, a first rate academic personage, I can't think of anybody uh, I would put ahead of him. That said, uh, let me say something about my, my presentation. Um, I got into this project when Thomas asked me to write a short commentary on uh, his paper, not the paper that he sent to everybody this morning, but the, the paper that, um, he uh, includes in the book. And in this paper, he tries to uh, engineer a rapprochement between uh, Jerry and, and Ronnie. And um, that's what my comment is about. It's about that paper. Uh, now, my presentation has uh, three sections. The, the little paper I wrote, it's five pages. Uh, it has these three sections. And my claim is the following. This is the claim that I, I, I give the three sections to sustain. The claim is that Jerry's critique of the shortcomings in Dworkin's argument in Law's Empire uh, as, a, as a practice, uh, that law is, a, is an interpretive practice, that this argument is completely successful. And as I've said in print and on several occasions, uh, Jerry's 1987 article, it's been referred to as a review, it's more like an excavation uh, of Law's Empire, is the single most important piece of work ever written on Law's Empire. No one, no one, live or dead, has written anything more insightful. And I want to spend the next 15 minutes explaining to you why this article is so important and why you should read it. All right. So, I have three sections to my, my comments. One, the metaphysics of meaning. I want to explain why the divide between Postuma and Dworkin is philosophically significant. Second, how does Dworkin, how does Dworkin's work, how does Law's Empire connect with the narrative that I advance about the centrality of the metaphysics of meaning? And finally, what about Jerry's critique of Dworkin's interpretivism? Why is it successful? All right, part one. As I mentioned, Thomas wants to engineer a rapprochement between Postuma and Dworkin. My argument is this is impossible. The reason it's impossible is that Jerry and Ronnie have deeply opposed metaphysical views of the nature of meaning. It's essentially Wittgenstein against the hermeneutics. In my little paper, I spent some time laying out the philosophical background to the metaphysical debate. Now, why is this important? Why should anybody care about the relationship of the metaphysics of meaning to legal philosophy? Well, I give you the man himself, Ronald Dworkin. In 1977, he said the following, debates over the nature of law are ultimately about epistemology and metaphysics. He thought that then, and I think it remains true today. There are two, as I said, there are two opposing views to the nature of meaning. They're irreconcilable, Wittgenstein and hermeneutics. In my opinion, Postuma deploys the Wittgensteinian critique of hermeneutic interpretivism in his critique of the argument in Law's Empire. And as I said, in my view, I think it's decisive. 
All right, so part one, what's the background in all of this? Uh, there's, a, there's a French philosopher named uh, Vincent de Kuhn. Here's the citation. It's in the, it's in the chat. You can go look up the chapter. In this chapter, de Kuhn, I think, does a great job of identifying what's at stake in the genealogy of the arguments about the metaphysics of meaning and the hermeneutic account of meaning. The key idea is this for the hermeneutes. In the move from sense to meaning, interpretation is inserted. In other words, you cannot move from the sense of words or signs to meaning without an act of interpretation. That's the fundamental metaphysical claim. The idea starts in Nietzsche, in the will to power, and then it works its way through philosophy up to law's empire. It starts with Nietzsche. It goes through Heidegger. You read in Being in Time, Heidegger talks, talks about Dasein's fundamental mode of being in the world is interpretive. You can't understand anything if you don't interpret. There are essentially two roots out of being and time, two roots in the history of philosophy. The first is the wild side. That's Foucault and Derrida, right? For them, interpretation is all about power or politics. And you can understand a great deal of the current cultural debate by this move. The sober path out of this, out of, out of Heidegger is Gadamer, Heidegger's student, and Charles Taylor, the notion of prejudice that you read in Truth and Method is the, the fundamental idea. But again, it's the same basic notion that to move from signs to meaning, you need the act of interpretation. There is no meaning without interpretation. Interpretation is fundamental. This is the central idea of the hermeneutical tradition. Now what de Kuhn uh, does a great job of explaining in this, this chapter I gave you, is that what's lost in the hermeneutic account is the crucial distinction between understanding and interpretation. Interpretation is inferential, okay, references to Brandon. It's an operation of mind. Understanding is direct and unmediated. This is, this is Wittgenstein. Understanding is a capacity. It's not an intellectual operation. So the contrast with the hermeneutic model of understanding and interpretation, right, Wittgenstein, I think is best illustrated. It's illustrated all over Wittgenstein, but you can look at 201 of the investigations where Wittgenstein's central contention is that interpretation is a non-starter when it comes to understanding meaning. Meaning is a social phenomenon that arises out of practices. Interpretation is a second order activity, one that depends on understanding already being in place. All right, so second part, how does Dworkin connect with this narrative about the metaphysics of meaning? In my opinion, Dworkin buys into this hook, line, and sinker. Page 50 of Law's Empire is the most important page in the book. It tells you everything you need to know about where Dworkin is coming from. Quote, any jurisprudence worth having must be built on some view of what interpretation is. Quote, the analysis of interpretation I construct and defend is the foundation of the rest of the book. And what is Dworkin's prime example for interpretation and understanding? It's, it's this. The most familiar occasion of interpretation so familiar that we hardly recognize it, is conversation. We interpret the sounds or marks another person makes in order to understand what he has said, right? This is right out of Heidegger. To understand anything, you have to interpret. You cannot even, you're now interpreting my words. You're not understanding them. You're interpreting them and then you'll understand them, of course. The same view, right, is in Stanley Fish. The reader creates the meaning of the text through the act of interpretation, right? These ideas run deep. It's no accident that Dworkin wound up embracing these ideas, however vaguely he did. All right, so what about Postuba? This is the third part, right? 
In my view, Jerry consistently employs the later Wittgenstein to make the point that meaning and understanding arise out of practices. Disagreement takes place against the background of a world of common meanings. Controversy or conflict presupposes consensus. All right, so what difference does it make, All right? It comes out in Postuma's detailed critique of the shortcomings of Dworkin's account of legal practice. I commend to you Roman numeral two of the essay, Jerry's essay, The Heresy of, of, uh, of, of Interpretation, page 300. Understanding for Dworkin is ultimately theoretical. It's the product of individual interpreters providing a general justification, a theory of the practice that provides, quote, a general justification for the consensus elements of the practice which constitute its raw data. Postuma, while the data is common ground, interpretations are private. This is the Protestant part. Theory precedes and determines practice. So what's the problem? Postuma says this account of law is problematic because, quoting Jerry, it makes interpretation of social practices insufficiently practical, insufficiently intersubjective, and thus insufficiently political. In Jerry's view, Dworkin's account of law as interpretation reduces participants in law to, I love this phrase, windowless social monads, right? If only I thought of this myself, what a phrase. It captures Dworkin's view perfectly. All right. Some claims about interpretation that Jerry makes. Here's one, here's one. The interpretive attitude is rare, rare. It's not pervasive. Easy and hard cases are not the same thing. They're different. Right? So the interpretive attitude is rare. Many social practices exhibit a thick texture of practice, gift giving, buying a newspaper, ordering a meal. Jerry's analysis of friendship is even, it's almost as good as Aristotle's. To understand a practice is to understand how to go on. This is a matter of learning a discipline, mastering a craft. These are all quotes from Jerry's article. Law is not about propositional truth. It's mastery of a discipline, which requires one to, quote, move around with familiarity in the world of the practice common to its participants. This common world is not the product of individual interpretations of the requirements of the practice to work in. Yeah? We understand the practice by virtue of our common participation in it. That's the central claim of Jerry's critique. Takeaways from these three points, there are four. Number one, Postum and Dworkin have a serious fundamental disagreement over the metaphysics of meaning. Second, Postum employs Wittgenstein and others to show that Dworkin's theory of law founders on its hermeneutical foundations. Three, to make his case, Postum employs the insights of the later Wittgenstein and his remarks on rule following, interpretation, and meaning. And last, in this way, Postuma puts the lie to the claims of people like Brian Bix and Scott Hershowitz that Wittgenstein has little to contribute to legal philosophy. Postuma shows that this is fundamentally incorrect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patterson. Uh, so are you, then we have now uh, Professor Thomas Bustamante. Uh, Thomas. Yes, I'm here. Uh, so, can you make me a host so I can share my screen? Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, okay. So, should I go now? Yes, you can go. You, okay. you, you are the host. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank uh, everyone for participating in this, in, in 
seminar. It's it's very important for me. It's a, a real opportunity, and I feel some somehow I I actually do not deserve all of this. Do not deserve to speak uh, together with um, uh, Postema, uh, Dennis, and Brian. It's it's a real really, really big honor, and, and it's a very important moment for me. Um, uh, just to, to reward this moment, I just wrote uh, a, a, new, a new essay for this opportunity. I meant originally to write about uh, my chapter in the book, but I was, I was persuaded by my wife to, to put it in writing, uh, uh, the ideas that I got here. I just uh, had a chat with her uh, a couple of days ago, and she just persuaded me to, to uh, try to put it on writing, and I, I worked very hard over the last three days to, to write a paper and, and I'm reading uh, some parts of it for you. Not everything, but just some parts of it. So here's my attempt to respond uh, to Dennis's analysis of my work. Uh, so that's the title, Posthumous Sociable Wild Protestant Interpretation, an attempted response to Dennis Patterson. So here's the paper. If you are brave enough to read uh, Ronald Workin's Lost Empire until the end, you will find the following quote in the last paragraph of the final page, I skip. Professor Postona has made an important early criticism on this idea. And I tried in revisiting the idea of Protestant interpretation to offer a friendly response. Postona's point was that the idea of Protestant interpretation eviscerates the social character of legal practice. To hold that legal interpretation requires a Protestant attitude is to require that interpreters make, a make their own judgment about the fit and justification of a given norm. Dworkinian judges, officials, and citizens in general would read legal materials in light of a moral point that is logically independent from the practice and rely on their private understandings of this point when they are asked to explain what the practice requires. On posthumous criticism, Dworkin's interpretive theory of law is insufficiently practical, insufficiently intersubjective, and thus insufficiently political. I argued in response that there are implicit commitments in Postman's own account of law, jurisprudence, and practical reasoning, which entail the same Protestant attitude advocated by the working. These commitments are what explains Postman's accounts of analogical reasoning, objectivity, and the rule of law. According to my response, it is because of these commitments that Postman has a sound response to legal positivists like Hart, Schauer, and Joseph Ross. But Partisan was not persuaded by my attempt to reconciliate uh, Dworkin and Postema. He argued that Dworkin and the hermeneutic tradition to which Dworkin is said to belong, blurred the distinction between understanding and interpretation, and that this is a serious mistake. Dworkin is wrong because his account of law and legal reasoning attributes to interpretation a foundational role, which has been shown to be unattainable but by Wittgenstein's regress, regress argument about the meaning of concepts. If we grant that the meaning of concepts is fixed by rules, we must reject the claim that rules are unintelligible without interpretation on the pain of falling into a vicious circularity. The only way to avoid the circularity is to accept that understanding a rule does not require a further intellectual operation. There must be a way of grasping a rule which is not an interpretation, but which is exhibited in what we call obeying a rule and going against it in actual cases. For pa uh, Patterson, we should abandon Dworkin's attempt to ground the meaning of legal concepts in constructive interpretation because it is at odds with Wittgenstein's regre regress argument. On Patterson's reading of Wittgenstein, meaning emerges from social practices in the following way. Meaning arises out of intersubjective use of linguistic symbols, the sense of which is a function of their shared use in practice. Everything from texts, signposts, and numbers all have meaning in virtue of their use in practices. The key to learning the meaning is acquiring the repertoire of behaviors that accompany the use of signs in these practices. Um, to understand the force of Wittgenstein's argument, we need to make clear what he means by interpretation in the first place. For neither working nor Postuma is using this concept in the same sense as he does. Wittgenstein's regress argument is an argument against regularism. To interpret a rule is to posit a meta-rule for determining its meaning. 
This is what Wittgenstein means when he says that we ought to restrict the term interpretation to the substitution of one expression or rule of the rule for another. Wittgenstein's use of the concept of interpretation is very different from working thought that interpreting a norm is making a judgment about its moral point, which is a point embedded in interpretation. Um, Wittgenstein's skepticism about interpretation is another way of arguing against a rule rationalist account of linguistic meaning, which postulates rules all the way down without providing a shared criterion of correctness to distinguish between the appropriate and erroneous applications of a given rule. Wittgenstein's regress argument can be classified as a version of fundamental pragmatist, pragmatism in the sense of Hubert Brandom. Fundamental pragmatists insist that knowing how to use a concept has a kind of explanatory primacy over knowing that something is the case. Explicit, theor ex explicit theoretical beliefs can be made intelligible only against a background of implicit practical abilities, instead of appealing to a platonistic intellectualism that postulates the existence of practice independent principles that we can deduct from the ideal world. Wittgenstein is a fundamental pragmatist because the conclusion of the regress argument is that there is a need for a pragmatist conception of norms, a notion of primitive correctnesses, correctness of performances implicit in practice that precedes and are presupposed by their explicit formulations in rules and principles. After characterizing Wittgenstein as a pragmatist in this fundamental sense, Brando makes a further point. Wittgenstein's argument is also a normative pragmatism, for the practice cannot provide a distinction between correct and incorrect applications of the explicit rules without presupposing implicit norms against the background of which they must be read. I believe that the root of Patterson's resistance to reconcile postman working lies in his account of the source of these implicit norms. When Patterson argues that the key to learning meaning is acquiring the repertoire of behaviors, he seems to understand the practice in which these rules are applied simply as regularities of performance. Such regularist approach, according to Brandon, is committed to identifying the distinction between correct and incorrect performances with that between regular and irregular performance. For a norm implicit in practice is just a pattern exhibited by the behavior. This type of account of social practice fails, however, because it either appeals to an implausible behavioristic explanation for the emergence of norms, if it presupposes that participants in communicative practice employ those rules because they have a cer certain dispositions to treat it as normatives in a, in a certain sense, or inadvertently smuggle normative arguments for validating these implicit norms. Patterson cannot avoid the, pro the problem, even if he explains these conceptual norms in terms of of communal assessment, in the sense that conceptual rules are characterized as correctly or incorrectly employed in terms of assessment, responses, and endorsements undertaken by the community to which the individual belongs. According to Brandon, traditional interpretations of Wittgenstein, such as those offered by Kripp and Crispin Wright, seem to adopt this kind of communal dispositional strategy but they fail either because the idea of communal assessment, endorsements, and, and verdicts is a fiction, or because it lacks a criterion for assessing the judgments made by the community itself, for there is no conceptual space for irregularity and for the community to violate a norm. A better response to the regress argument, therefore, is to explain the implicit norms that make the explicit rules of the practice intelligible in terms of the attitudes of the practice participants. That is, in terms of commitments, acknowledgements, attributions, endorsements, and recognitions of the users of, of conceptual norms. Brandon finds a third alternative between regularism and regularist dispositional interpretation of Wittgenstein. In Kant's idea that what distinguishes judging and intentional doing from the activities of non-sapient creatures is that they involve some special source of mental process. It's not uh, that they involve some special source of mental process, but that they are things knowers and agents are in, in a distinctive way responsible for. To make a rational judgment is to, undertake, is to undertake commitment to endorse a conceptual norm by acknowledging its authority, 
It is, in other words, to place oneself under such authority and to make oneself liable to a normative assessment under this norm. The key to understand this thought lies in Kant's reliance on the enlightenment idea that responsibility and authority, commitment and entitlement, derive from the practical, practical attitude of human beings. Kant understands freedom as a kind of authority. It consists in the authority to make one's ourselves rationally responsible by taking ourselves to be responsible. In other words, the capacity to be bound by norms and the capacity to bind ourselves by norms are one and the same. That's uh, Brandon again. I believe that the working is after this idea when he argues for Protestant interpretation in law, politics, and morality. Political obligation for the working is not just a matter of obeying the discrete political decisions of the community one by one. It is a Protestant attitude because it demands fidelity to a scheme of principles each citizen has a responsibility to identify ultimately by himself as his community's scheme. The question whether this thought is compatible with Postema or with, with Wittgenstein depends on whether this Protestant attitude can also be a sociable interpretation in Postema's sense. Can we make sense of Protestant interpretation by re retaining the Hegelian idea that all authority and responsibility are ultimately social phenomena? Perhaps there is a positive answer to this question. Authority and responsibility in Hegel's scheme are the products of attitudes, on the one hand, of those who undertake responsibility and exercise authority, and on the other hand, of those who hold others responsible and acknowledge their authority. So we can concede that there seems to be something missing in Kant's account of freedom and moral responsibility and on working concept of Protestant interpretation. But sustains the practice is not the individualistic endorsement of implicit norms, but the reciprocity of the attitudes of whole community participants in the practice. Only if a community of speakers commits to the authority of these norms, that is, if these norms are mutually acknowledged and endorsed, can there be a standard for correctness and incorrectness in the application of a practice norms? The question, therefore, is not whether Protestant interpretation needs to be complemented by reciprocal recognition. It, it is whether there can be recyclable, reciprocal recognition without the kind of moral responsibility that Protestant interpretation requires. Legal reasoning as first person plural practical reasoning. That's the, a new section. If we are to rescue Dworkin's, interpreted, uh, Dworkin's Protestant interpretation from po Patterson's skepticism about my intent to reconcile working and Postman, we must demonstrate that it makes sense, even if we follow Postman's insight, that moral reasoning and legal reasoning, too, uh, is a form of first person plural practical reasoning. Postman's idea that morality is a species of fir first person plural practical reasoning stems from a human insight about how justice is made possible by the development in human societies of a common sense of interest available to its members. Our interest here does not reside in the explanation that Hume provides for the, for the dependence of practical rationality on passions and perhaps our dispositions to act in a certain way. It lies instead in Hume's explanation of how conventions come about and how moral norms are recognized and acknowledged through a common framework of practical reasoning. Human beings develop when they recognize that their substance subsistence uh, depends on an association with other human beings, a common sense of interest in a general scheme of mutual restraint. Humans realize the need for communication and for a sense of interest supposed common to all, which entails a new practical attitude, a shifting perspective on the practical problem or, or facing the parties. According to Postman's reconstruction of this human insight, uh, this point of the development of, of society uh, in this point, then, a fundamental change in our practical reasoning occurs. The practical situation defined in, defined in terms of the structure of individual preferences remains unchanged, but the parties radically shift their frame of reference. The shift does not by itself solve or dissolve the practical problem facing the parties, rather it transfor transforms it. Conflict among the parties may still remain, but the parties no longer view their conflicts from the, pers the respective, from the respective private or individual perspectives, but rather for a common one. The unity of agency with, with reference to which they deliberate shifts 
first person plural replaces uh, first person singular. The first person plural perspective changes not the dat data which constitutes the object of our judgments and assessments, but the framework of interpretation in which the data is articulated and pursued. This seems to pose a powerful challenge to Protestant interpretation. It is the fact that legal reasoning purports to be a first person plural type of practical reasoning that makes it social and that makes it important that our interpretive stances toward the practice are mutually acknowledged and endorsed in the sense of being reciprocally recognized by our partners in the discursive envi environment in which we undertake our commitments and bind ourselves to the norms we assert in the conclusion of a legal argument. Protestant uh, interpretation may be taught to defy, therefore, the social character of the normative practice of law, which is a vital aspect of legal reasoning. One of the central features of legal reason is that it is constitutively political. It is a form of reasoning undertaken in specific fora by distinctively public processes, rituals, and commitments. As Postman showed in his masterpieces, essays on the jurisprudence of common law, legal reasoning requires an artificial reason. One of the features of the artificial reason of law for common lawyers, pardon me, um, uh, like Hale, uh, was that legal reasoning was a, a, a practical argumentation in which participants mesh their practical reasoning to bring in their several quests into a common stock of mutual communication, whereby each of them became in a great measure the participant and common processor of the other's learning and knowledge. As Postuma explains, Hale's point is that legal reason is not only distinctive, but also common, for it is attached, uh, for it is practiced. A common skill or art, a discipline of reasoning shared among those engaged in this practice, but not by others. Although neither Postuma nor we need to subscribe to Hale's view that legal reasoning is accessible only by a legal elite, his point that legal reasoning is shared among those engaged in the practice of legal argumentation retains its force. Here's a nice way of making sense of Patterson's objection to my view that Dworkin and Postuma can be brought together. It may seem that this social aspect of law poses a threat to Dworkin's idea of Protestant interpretation and that Postuma cannot be reconciled with Dworkin because he shares Wittgenstein's idea that a, understanding a practice is mastering a discipline. B, legal skills and abilities are a matter of shared capacity. And C, interpretive disagreement takes place against the background of a word uh, of common meanings. Perhaps the artificial reason of law cannot be a reasoning in which each participant resorts to her own judgment about the point of the social practice in which she participates. What we got instead would be a common argumentative perspective, which is inconsistent with the very idea of Protestant interpretation. That's a new session, Protestant interpretation as first person plural practical reasoning. The objection construed at the end of the previous section provides the most powerful challenge I can imagine to the workings idea of Protestant interpretation, but it comes with, with a price for it misses the crucial aspect of practical reasoning, which is the interpretive responsibility of the participants in the social practice. The right way to respond to the objection is not to deny the mutuality and reciprocity of reasoning in social practice like law and moral argumentation. Neither is it to dismiss Postuma's important claim that moral and legal arguments can be regarded as first person plural reasoning or that practical legal reasoning develops a social framework for assessing a legal claim. It is rather to show that the Protestant attitude demanded by the working is an important aspect of this first person plural practical reasoning. In other words, it must be possible to show that it is a feature of the social practices uh, that every interpreter of the practice must adopt a Protestant attitude when she plays her role in the practice and underta undertakes an effort to understand what the practice requires her to do by, or entitles her to demand. In other words, Protestant interpretation must be made coherent with a respectful attitude towards other members of the practice. It must be construed as a duty of the practice participants or as part of the discipline participants should master. Let us begin with the second idea. I skipped a few of the pages of the paper, a few paragraphs. 
which holds that a first person plural perspective might require a Protestant interpretation. As Brendan's analysis of normative social practice shows, we place ourselves under the authority of norms, not by transferring our judgment to a personified community or by assuming by, by way of fiction that communities can have an intention different from that of their members. I skip something again. The exit to this deadlock is however, within our reach as Posema explains, the distinction between sing singular and plural perspectives is practical, not ontological. It is not the case that participants in a public practical discourse must reach the same conclusions in their interpretive reasoning, for participants are committed to make responsible judgment rather than a particular result of this reasoning process. As Posema explains, plural deliberation mo moves into two stages, or rather cycles repeatedly through 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 two stages. In the first, the, a participant asks, what ought we to do through the combined and coordination actions to bring about something? Whereas in the second, she, she inquires, what is my part in this concerted action? If the law is regarded as a normative social practice in the sense that Brandon suggested language is, and that Postma acknowledged that customary, customary law is, then all of the participants must be asked to make a judgment about how to understand the norms of, of the legal system, consider in their interrelations and multiple connections and relationships, and to undertake responsibility for this judgment. But what is the part of each participants in this discursive game? The first thing to consider before answering this question is that although a holistic unity is expected, there is no guarantee that this agreement will not come about and there, is, and there seems to be only one way to, respons to act responsibly in light of a disagreement, which is precisely to adopt Dworkin's Protestant interpretation. Although I argued extensively in defense of the possibility to accommodate Protestant interpretation in Postman's insightful accounts of law, legal reasoning, analogy, objectivity, practical reasoning, sociable jurisprudence, and the rule of law, perhaps there is still something important to say the point is that both Postma in his earlier essay, Protestant Interpretation and Social Practice, and Patterson in his comments on my response to Postma, seem to disregard the fact that Working's account of interpretation is clearly not a conversational interpretation, as it were. The Working's interpretation is called Protestant because it explicitly rejects either the view that interpretation of a social practice means discovering the purposes of intentions of the other participants in the practice, or, or the thought that it means discovering the purposes of the community that houses the practice, conceived as itself having some form of mental life uh, or group consciousness. The first view is rejected for it is inconsistent with the internal structure of an argumentative social practice because it is a feature of such practices that an interpretive claim is not just a claim about what other interpreters think. The claims that participants make in their constructive interpretations are not about intentions or mental states. They are rather about what the practice means, not what they, the authors or the participants in the practice might have meant. Nevertheless, Dworkin thinks that participants may disagree about what the practice means only up to a certain point. I skipped Working's quote and some paragraphs after that. I think that this quote teaches us a lesson about Protestant interpretation. This type of interpretation is needed to make it possible to distinguish the Working's product, project from strict conventionalism, which postulates that mere acceptance by a group is enough to determine the status of a given norm. The interpretive attitude is Protestant because each of the participants in a social practice must distinguish between trying to decide what other members of the community think the practice requires and trying to decide for himself what, re what it really means. The working point here seems to be that this attitude or interpretive responsibility rejects the idea of asymmetry in authority. If the law, uh, probably Brian deserves a quote here, <laughs> if the law is to be authoritative upon us, it is because of the acknowledgments and commitments we make when we participate in, in the game of giving and asking for reasons in Brandon's sense. It is because we make critical 
practical judgments about making these judgments. Now, and by keeping these, oh, sorry, it is because we make critical practical judgments and by making these judgments, keep the law in force, when we earn the recognition of other participants in the same practice who play the same critical role in the game of, give, uh, of giving and asking for reasons. The interpretive responsibility is both a moral and a social responsibility. Interpreters engage, just like, like Postman claimed, in a shared intentional action or better, a rational action because they refuse to accept an interpretation as valid just because, because others do. Posthumous protest, Protestant interpretation of customary law. That's a bold claim. I'm sorry, uh, Jerry is here to correct me. Uh, to come back to the quote in the beginning of this article, law for the working is a domain defined by Protestant attitude. It is this attitude that makes each citizen responsible for imagining what these commitments require in new circumstances. We should adopt this attitude not only in court, but in our ordinary lives. And we must assume, given this attitude, that though judges may, may, may have the last word, their word is not, for that reason, the best word. Hence, to defer to the authority of law is not to submit our, yourself to someone else's judgment or balance of reasons. It is rather to play a role in a social practice that you help to sustain with your Protestant attitude. To argue for the workings claimed about Protestant interpretation is to advocate the view that the law is a normative social practice. It, it, it is remarkable how this description of the practice of law is similar to Postman's account of customary international law. In effect, Postman rega regards the use of customary laws as a distinguished for uh, as distinguished from other regularities of behavior by mode of engagement or participating patient of custom following agents in a normative practice. Their mode of participation is characterized by three essential interrelated features, mutual commitment, a notion of correct use and common resources, commitment, correctness, and commons. I believe that no other author has made a greater impact in Postman's account of international customary law than Robert Brandon, and, then, and that he regards these three features in a way that is similar to the way I described uh, in the opening section of this paper. To take part in the practice of customary law, rational A agents must have intentional states like beliefs and attitudes. They must avoid these intentional states, actions and judgments. That is, they must acknowledge them as their own, accept responsibility for them, and submit themselves to criticisms of all, from other, others regarding them. All the quotes now are, are from, uh, until the end is from the same paper by Postman. But these commitments are for Postman not reductible to mental states or empirical facts, such as mere regularities of behavior. They are, in other words, irreducibly normative in the sense that they involve taking responsibility for one's actions, judgments, and attitudes, and recognizing the, st the standing of others to hold one to this responsibility and assess one's actions and judgments in light of that responsibility. The social endorsement of these norms by mutual commitments of other participants who are normatively related to each other is what establishes the proprieties or conditions of correctness of the practice. When rational agents, when as rational agents, participants in the practice acknowledge its normative force and take responsibility through their commitments, they thereby acknowledge the conditions of correct and incorrect application of the practice and make sense of the possibility of mistakes and violations of customary norms. Finally, Postema believes that normative practices constitute a kind of commons in the following two senses. First, like Wittgenstein, Postema believes that what is crucial for successful participation in the practice is mastery of a discipline and acquiring capacities of perception, articulation, inference, and judgment necessary for such, such mastery. Second, he argues that participants in the practice must reciprocally attribute to other participants a standing to judge what they are doing and why. It is this idea, in my view, 
that brings Postuma and working together and provides the decisive arguments to sustain that, like the working, uh, Ritchie endorses a form of Protestant interpretation. Light working, Postuma thinks that from the point of view of the participant, what is decisive is not what any other party says or thinks about this, or even what most, or even all of them say or think about this, but what, but rather what they are actually doing. In fact, the key feature is the possibility to judge and assess these deeds to show that they are correct or incorrect through standards of, of correctness implicit in the practice. In the same way that working thinks that legal principles, theories, and moral points are embedded in the practice of law. Just like, uh, probably uh, uh, Thiago de Ka deserves a quote here. Uh, just like Wittgenstein, Brandon uh, and working, Postema is thus a fundamental pragmatist because he believes that anyone familiar with these practices can master these standards. Again, just like working, Postema argues that no one not even the entire community has an unchangeable final say on what the norms of the practice are. It is precisely this idea that makes Protestant interpretation of custom also, no, sorry, it is precisely this idea that makes Postema's interpretation of custom also a Protestant interpretation. As the reader can see, this does not undermine, but rather presuppose the social aspect of law because the Protestant interpretive attitude is also shared by all of the members of the normative practice of law. As Postuma go, goes on to say, right after the fragment I quoted in the paragraph above, the standards of the practice do not exist in the heads of the participants, but in the practice. The activity rather than the, any articulated account of it is the fundamental, the commons from which all the participants draw and to which they contribute by their doings, thinking, sayings, and interpretations. Uh, all of our formulae, no, uh, no, uh, period. All accounts or formulations are ultimately accountable to its commons. I hope that it is clear by now um, the fact that this idea is consistent with uh, the thought that no one has authority to uh, to an unchangeable final say. I hope that this um, makes it the case for the possibility of a sociable while Protestant interpretation of law. Protestant interpretation is not rebel or revolutionary interpretation. It's not an attitude against the practice to impose a solipsist preference upon these commons. Protestant interpretation demands a sort of partnership, which working advocated in his account of democracy and political equality. It is the attitude of those who regard themselves as, as responsible participants in the discursive environment of democracy. It is this, if this is understood under the, under the working partnership conception of democracy, the need for Protestant interpretation is part of the democratic conditions under the working's account of democracy. I hope to have showed, therefore, that posthumous jurisprudence is a Protestant attitude towards the law. As I argued in my first comment on Postum and Workings Exchange on Interpretation, the Protestant attitude is part of what sustains our commitment to the rule of law. And I doubt that there is anyone in the world that understands this ethos uh, behind this commitment and their normative significance uh, better than Gerald Postum. Postum's account of the rule of law is Protestant because it requires each participant in political practice to make critical judgments about her own action and the action of others with regard to the law. Each participant of, uh, participant of the legal community becomes personally responsible for acknowledging claims and uh, the arguments of others and for holding others accountable under the rule of law. One cannot do it without the attitude that working described as Protestant interpretation. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas. Good presentation. Uh, okay. So, so how do I stop sharing? Yes. You have to, it's on the top of your- Yeah, I stopped. Okay. Yeah, I'm back now. Okay. So thank you very much for the- for the trial, for the paper. Uh, I guess we have time for discussion or?
Does Dallas no. have a response? Yes, it's supposed yes, to be please. up to six. Yes, please, Professor Beats. No, I'm just saying, I thought maybe Professor Patterson might want to respond. Ah, OK. Professor, yes. Professor Patterson, please. Yeah, sure. Um, well, nothing excites me more than um, the secondary literature on Wittgenstein. Uh, but I'll try not to geek out too much on this. Uh, let me just talk about one point in Thomas's uh, new paper. So he says, uh, he asserts on page uh, three that um, to interpret a rule is to posit a meta rule for determining its meaning. So to understand the force of Wittgenstein's argument, we need to be clear about what Wittgenstein meant by interpretation. For neither Dworkin nor Postuma is using this concept in the sense he does. Wittgenstein's use of the concept of interpretation is very different from Dworkin's thought. Well, um, I don't think so. Uh, now, you know, Bob Branham's got his own agenda, inferentialism, very interesting theory. I'm not sure that it's great for an interpretation of Wittgenstein, but you know, as you were talking, I thought, well, let me just let me just see what I have on the shelf. So I pulled out uh, Peter Hacker's book, Wittgenstein's Place in 20th Century Philosophy. That's the site in the chat. On page 219, he says, understanding utterances is not the same as translating or interpreting them. The former is akin to an ability, whereas the latter are typically activities one engages in. Uh, although there is a sense of interpret, which is synonymous with it is to understand, right? And uh, all understanding involves interpretation. That's Quine, okay? This is the view he's arguing against. Uh, interpreting is a matter of clarifying utterances by means of more perspicuous paraphrases, especially in cases where an utterance admits of divergent readings, legal statutes. It is uh, this interpretation as opposed to that. Now, here's a line that's right out of Postuma. Quote, interpreting an utterance, therefore, presupposes understanding where more than one way of understanding is on the cards. And interpretation weeds out the worse from the better way of understanding. I submit to you that reading of Wittgenstein is more than plausible. I mean, is there anybody in the world who's a greater authority on the Wittgenstein and Hacker? I don't think so, but he's certainly up there. Okay. And add to that is exactly the view that Jerry expresses in his critique of Ronnie. Now, the other point that uh, you make in your paper, Thomas, about interpretation and working, you say that Wittgenstein's use of interpretation is very different from Dworkin's thought that interpreting a norm is making a judgment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I gave you page 50 of, of Law's Empire, the most fundamental point that Dworkin makes on that page is that you don't understand what I'm saying unless you're interpreting it. That's his view, all right? If you wanna criticize a view of interpretation and say that Dworkin has something different, that's what you have to contend with. The idea of the point of the practice and the norms and all that, that's all, that's all way down the, the highway. As Jerry points out, the reason his article is so important is because unlike so many people in analytic jurisprudence, Jerry gets right to the heart of what's wrong with Dworkin's view. And it is that excavation that I think is significant, but everything that, everything that Hacker says about interpretation and Wittgenstein, I think is correct. Um, there are many, many, many people who've written very interesting things about Wittgenstein on interpretation that go way beyond the, the technical stuff that you know, we've been talking about. Um, this is the best, this Tully article that I just put in the chat, this is the single best use of Wittgenstein on interpretation to take the idea way beyond the original context and to demonstrate its importance. It's a very influential piece. It's a great article. He talks about both Habermas and Charles Taylor, but his points about interpretation and what's wrong with the idea that all understanding is interpretation and why it's a non-starter, 
uh, I think it's a terrific piece. So if anyone's interested in the literature, those are just a couple of things you might want to check out. Um, can I thank just you very much, some... Professor. Please, Thomas. Um, thank you, uh, Dennis. That's fantastic. And uh, I saw that I was really, really impressed because I sent um, my paper uh, to Dennis this morning. And after one hour, he returned an email saying he had already read it. And then uh, half an hour later, he sent me a book uh, on Wittgenstein. Uh, so it's impressive, this working capacity. I, I don't know if I'll ever uh, going to have this one day. It's easy and, when you're at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in any case, um, my point is not to determine which interpretation of Wittgenstein is correct. And it is, since I am not um, uh, an expert and uh, my knowledge of Wittgenstein is very basic. What I will do in, this, in the next version of this paper is always to put an adjective according to someone's interpretation of Wittgenstein, according to someone's, so I can kind of protect myself and say that if this guy is wrong, it's not my fault. Uh, I will make sure that I, I rewrite the paper very carefully to, to, to put the words in, in, in the mouth of, of the people. Uh, I adopted... Um, uh, in, in, the, in the excerpt that you quoted, uh, um, an interpretation provided by Robert Brandom. And I was, I, I, we, we are reading Brandom now, actually, Paulo, Thiago, and I are giving a course for graduate students at UFMG and UFPA uh, on Brandom. And I'm not sure if Brandon got uh, Wittgenstein uh, right, but I was fascinating about his account of social practices and his account of um, uh, how norms get their meaning. And I think that uh, one of the ways uh, to, to make a charitable, uh, a charitable reading of the working is to read it through Brandon's eyes. Uh, and when you do that, when you, when you um, interpret uh, his theory according to much of what uh, Brandon is saying, uh, the working becomes much more, um, uh, much pl very plausible, okay? And I think that uh, furthermore, I would like uh, to hear uh, Jerry about this because it will probably make a very uh, bold claim. I think that uh, the article on customary law that I quote, customary international law that I quote, was, um, was written in a, in a year in which uh, Jerry probably was, uh, was very well impressed by, by Brando. I don't know, but in the same year, he published the, art, the, the piece on analogy that also quotes Brando very, uh, uh, in, in a very nice way. So I think that, in a sense, Brandon, um, I think that I think that Jerry's view on customary laws endorsed uh, much of what Brandon was saying. I'm not sure if, if Jerry would endorse Brandon's uh, reading of Wittgenstein, but Brandon's own theory was determinant in uh, Jerry's uh, own um, views about uh, customary international law. And, and the idea that authority is not final because everyone in the practice is entitled to make a judgment about a norm says is there. It isn't working and it is, is, it is in postima. And I think that this is a brilliant idea. I think that this is the only way uh, that we can uh, say that the law is legitimate without this idea. I would never accept to abide by a law. I think that it makes, it works as a theory of political justification, as a theory of the rule of law, as a theory of democracy, as a theory of political legitimacy. And I think it works, it works perfectly. And it, if you read the whole of the working theory in light of this idea, it makes sense. And if you read everything in Postuma's uh, long career, except for the, 
uh, paper that Dennis uh, cited. It makes perfect sense. The only, uh, <laughs> I think that I'm talking about, about a, a magnificent career. Uh, in which I've read uh, about 30 pieces of, on, of from Postum, uh, not everything that he wrote, but a lot. And you can appreciate from the introduction that uh, the I and Tiago wrote for the book, which is very friendly. It's a, it's, it's a kind of a way to express how we feel that posthumous theory is important. Uh, you can say that I agree with everything that uh, uh, Jerry says, except for that article that, that we're talking about. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thomas, you know, we, you know, like Marshall McLuhan in the movie Annie Hall, we might have Jerry Possima right here. Um, we yeah. <laughs> Can it, may I say just a couple of things? This, um, first of all, from a personal point of view, um, the Protestant interpretation picture, uh, paper was written, um, it's in my youth. Um, and it really, did set me a set of problems that I felt I needed to address. And I spent a large part of the rest of my career dealing with those problems. And the main one is, what do we mean by the social nature of this practice of deliberation or the like? Um, and I, it has a historical dimension when I went to the common law, and it has a sort of analytical dimension when I talked about analogy. Um, and then I tried to, to um, see whether there's some room to play with and explain um, away some conundrums in, in customary law, especially customary international law. Um, I was struggling with it and trying to figure out the idea of um, salience um, in the game theoretic literature, um, all of those various um, explorations were um, attempts to deal with what I thought was the right idea, but I didn't know why or how. Um, and what I found, um, so what I hear is, Dennis is really focused on the Protestant interpretation paper itself. And you, Thomas, sort of started building in all the um, other things as well. Um, th those, you were right, Thomas, to bring those in. They weren't in my head back in 1987. Um, let me make one interesting, I think, comment here, Dennis, just to your point about um, how um, these um, Wittgensteinians or, or these um, um, followers of, of um, the hermeneutic dimension um, responded to um, Ronnie's paper and then Ronnie's book and my paper. Um, you know, Stanley Fish was a, a near colleague of mine. That is a neighbor colleague of mine. He had Duke and I at Carolina. Um, and I just by chance ran into him just after the Protestant paper was published. And he said, marvelous, you nailed him. And I didn't really want his support. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping for something like you were so dead wrong, right? Um, but he did just right. Um, but of course, I didn't want to argue that, um, no, there's not a single interpreter. Um, everything is determined by the community. As Thomas was saying, that's just not my view, right? And it seems not right, though there is something crucial to the, to the social dimension of it, right? Um, that brings me to Brian's um, invocation of Levinson's Catholicism. Um, that's just the wrong way of doing, getting a, a social practice by setting it up so that there is a, um, um, a final authority. Um, Thomas is right, that's just not, well, in my view, that's not the way to go. Um, I call that an unaccountable accountability holder in my work on the rule of law. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't do us well for the idea of the rule of law. Um, so all that, all that said, um, um, my thoughts really did go a good bit further 
than um, Protestant interpretation. Um, but that's because I guess I wanted to know, Dennis, just what I meant when I said those things, um, even if they were on the right track. Um, can I give you my uh, Stanley Fish story quickly? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as you as you as you may know, I had a I had a rather uh, uh, intense exchange with Stanley in the pages of the Texas Law Review a few decades ago, and my argument was that uh, that Ronnie and Stanley have the same theory of law because it's both built on the same theory of interpretation. Stanley called me at home and asked me, why did you say that? And I said, because it's true. And he said, uh, well, I'm gonna write a response to this, which is great, you know, young academic like me, right? It was like, it was great. So he wrote an article with the title, how come you do me like you do? And of course, um, my reply was, you made me do it. I do think that uh, <laughs> they both have the same theory of interpretation and the same theory of law. Now, interestingly, um, the, the problem with Stanley's view is, is that, you know, he argues initially that the reader creates the meaning of the text. And this is an idea that he lifted from somebody else. He's not original with him. But then people beat him up and, on it and said, well, you know, it's solipsistic and all the rest. And that's when he went to the idea of an interpretive community. But the problem is, is that those two ideas are at war with each other. You can't, if you're part of an interpretive community, then you don't have individualistic interpretation. The reader doesn't create the meaning of the text, the community does. Yeah. So in my view, Stanley has never resolved this contradiction in his, in his thought. Um, and it took him from a path away from Dworkin. But I still think uh, his essay on the law in the book, is there a text in this class, is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's complete, he is as Ernest Weinrib once described him, the sophist of our age. He mm. is absolutely that. That guy could take anything and make it sound plausible. And this notion that the reader creates the meaning of the text is absolute nonsense. But I wouldn't want to have to argue with Stanley about it because that guy really takes no prisoners. And Ronnie found that out firsthand. Mm. Enough said. So uh, thank this you. This is both all an advertisement for Thomas's next book, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, yes. do you want to? Would you like to explain to the audience so you can get the pre-sale? Okay, that that's a very good idea. Let's see. I think I have this. Yeah, I have the screen here. So um, just tell us about uh, it. The, the, the point of this meeting. I mean, uh, the excuse no. for uh, one of the the, the very. Um, the initial idea was to merchandise the book. So here's the, uh, the of the book is at heart publishing. Uh, I just revised the proofs uh, a couple of um, days ago. It has been sent to the publisher and it's going to be published. Um, uh, they told me in November, October of no, or November. So it's so already- Thomas, not, not this book, the next book. The oh, the that... next book, it's, it's uh, actually a secret. Uh, the next book <laughs> is edited with Margaret Martin. Uh, she's in the room. Hi, Margaret, I saw you there uh, because I, I'm making the attendance list. It's a book on, on, um, on the fish working debate. Uh, so now it's no longer a secret. So uh, Brian knows because he's one of the authors. Dennis is too, another uh, author. Margaret will be there. Um, uh, there are many big, big names. Fish well, himself will important. be there. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we, we are working on it. It's going to come up probably in 2022 because the deadline is uh, late. 2021, yeah, and that's it. So we, we, we will probably carry on this conversation, especially because uh, fish came up quite naturally in the in the discussion phase, yeah. yeah. Uh, was that book that you mentioned, uh, Brian? <laughs> uh, 
I think you're muted. Yeah. Oops. I think Brian disappeared. We yes. No, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Okay. So. So, so what, yeah, I mean, that's the book I'm talking about. And, and you didn't yeah. mention sufficiently that Stanley Fish has promised to be part of it too. No, he promised to respond to uh, all the papers, which is uh, even better. Yeah, he promised. He's going to write the final chapter responding to all the authors. Yeah. So be nice to him. <laughs> no, there's no being nice to Stanley. Yeah. <laughs> I just tell uh, uh, for Jerry that we hope that uh, we have been nice to you in the book. <laughs> well, yeah, no question, no question about it. Uh, so, uh, Thomas, uh, do you think that you should give the word for the participants to sure, to make questions, sure. or do you have time? Yes, we have half an hour because it's supposed to go until six o'clock. So we have. Okay, so uh, if someone wants to to ask something, please. Uh, I see Kenneth uh, Edinburgh raising his hand. Turn on the microphone. Uh, how, how do we, Kenneth? Please speak now. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So I, this is maybe it may be a question for Jerry, although maybe it's also a question for for Dennis. It could be also. I don't want to get bogged down with you know Dworkin exegesis, and I'm no defender of Dworkin, but I'm wondering if I'm thinking about the windowless monad comment, and I'm wondering if if after you know looking back on the rest of you know our interpretive history, if you will, with Dworkin. Um, if if maybe we would uh, consider revisiting the the windowless part of the of the windowless monad comment, um, you know maybe I'm misreading Dworkin through a kind of I don't know how to put it maybe a Calabrian lens I'm not sure but I I always think of Dworkin as as kind of um, I think of the, the the truth makers for our interpretations in his view as being um, a certain communal subset of the available values that the community can embrace. So the reason I call it a Calabrian is that you know one community embraces you know life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and another community embraces as their primary values you know equality, fraternity, and liberty, or something like that. Um, and so there's a there's a there's a space of uh, there's a space of different values that a community can 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 embrace. Um, and it's over time how the community um, articulates the relative weights of those values through its choices about how to proceed that then function as the truth makers for um, interpretations that the monads make, so to speak. Uh, and so I guess this is my, my thinking that, that while there's still definitely, you know, we're still definitely all monads there's, in that view. There's no question about it. Um, there has to be some sort of assumption of um, a window through which the monads can kind of view each other. At least a monad can view the group as a whole or something by looking at those choices over history. And that's what they're trying to track when, you know, for example, they try to make their, their, um, their interpretations fit with what came before, for example. Does that make any sense? Yeah, may I? Um, hi, Ken. How are you? Good. Um, I think the windowless monad comment um, needs to be placed in a context that I can't remember anymore. Um, but um, the um, the main thesis, even in that early paper, was um, that um, while this interpretation or this um, um, argumentative practice is engaged by each, um, it's with an eye to and understanding that the offerings are offerings of construals of our practice. So there always have to be windows 
and what comes through the windows, if you will, must be a sense of what it is that we are capable of, we are doing. Um, not each one and not taken in an aggregate, but as, as if we were a, um, um, an, act, um, an actor and each of the, um, if you will, discrete participants makes a contribution to that and we better take that seriously. Um, now, the, that doesn't settle the question of whether there are um, discrete such communities and even that one or even that one might be a party to more than one of them, right? Um, and I suspect once you get a really um, interesting and complex um, practice, if we want to call the, the legal system of any jurisdiction a practice in that sense, it's going to be pretty damn complex. And there are no doubt going to be overlapping, intersecting, discrete such communities. That complicates the case. I mean, Thomas is really good about this, I think. Um, you want to each takes responsibility, but it's a responsibility, as it were, for the whole. Um, yet, what's the whole? That seems to me a really important question for a Bustamante, Postuma, whatever line of inquiry, because it's not really obvious that there's a single one in any given legal system jurisdiction that I'm aware of. There might be, it might have been true. It might have been true in 17th century England. Um, in part because they were a fairly limited number of such participants and they all sat in Westminster, right? That's not a, um, there, we, gotta, we gotta do a good bit of work to get from Hale's context to Dworkin's and ours. So I think that's a really crucial question. Um, and uh, I don't know how yet to answer it, but I can see why it's fundamental to the plausibility of the strategy. Can I make a question, Saul, uh, to Postuma, to Jerry? Yes, please. Um, your answer, Jerry, now uh, just brings me an example. Um, as a Brazilian, I participated in the election of Jair Bolsonaro. I spent the previous day uh, uh, in the streets trying to turn the votes of the people. And I talked to more than 100 people and I just ride the buses uh, go randomly, just trying to sit on the bus and talk to people. And I turned the votes of about 20 people uh, from Bolsonaro to Haddad. Many people were rude to me, but I, that's what I did. But, they, 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 but uh, there, was, there is a sense in which, even though I, I campaigned uh, for Adad and I was there uh, doing my part, uh, there is a sense in which we can say that I am responsible to whatever Bolsonaro does to a foreign country uh, and there is a sense in which uh, I am not, because there are different roles, that, 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 there are yeah. different ways that I connect to my responsibilities. I have responsibilities just because I am a member of the community, say, if Brazilian, if the Brazilian government uh, dissipates uh, a community of Native Americans in the Amazon. In a sense, I am... Uh, because I am a citizen, I am responsible because I am connected, because I took part in these processes, because I failed uh, in preventing them. I am responsible. But there is a sense in which I am not. So perhaps uh, there, is, uh, there are different responsibilities attached to the people who belong uh, in normative practices. That's my intuition. My intuition is that part of the responsibilities that I as a member have is to adopt uh, uh, a Protestant interpretation because it, it is to make a judgment 
a responsible judgment about the norms that make uh, the community. I all, everyone has, this, has the role and the responsibility of doing it. Th that's my point. And I think that this works for your account of the rule of law and your account of customary law too. That was my point in these two paper, the papers, the paper that is published in the book and this one that I just wrote uh, uh, in the last two or three days, yeah. Yeah, um, so I've been struggling a lot, not just within the context of legal philosophy, but more generally in um, my understanding of democracy and the community in which democracy needs to play a role. These questions keep coming up. If we're a democracy, there's a demos, what's the demos? Who are the people? Um, and we've got it. We've got to address that question. That's a, a larger question yet, but it's the one in which, into which the question that Ken's comment um, put in my mind. Um, and I had a narrower view of it at the when we were just exchanging here, and that was um, even if we're talking about. Um, um, the understanding of the implication for rights and responsibilities of a certain part of, um, in our case, American law, there may well be different communities there. Um, all of them American, but nevertheless different communities. And this doesn't yet get to the utterly disaffected and alienated populist dimension um, elements in American or if in your case, Brazilian um, uh, political society. Um, so you not notice how nested that is. Um, and yet I'm convinced that um, we need to, um, if we're thinking at all about um, responsibility, either a democratic responsibility or, dem or responsibility as a democratic citizen or responsibility of someone who um, approaches the question, what are we through our law now committed to? Those, those two dimensions always have to deal, struggle with constantly. What are the we? Um, if you take um, a, a simple minded reading of Dworkin, which I think I probably had back in that 87 paper, um, that Protestant just meant um, one's own, as it were, solipsistic view of things, um, then that question never comes up. I'm the we, I know what the boundaries of we are. Uh, once you start pushing it out like I was trying to do in that paper, you got to start facing that question. Um, and I, I haven't done that, but I think that's, that's a really crucial part of things. I think it's internal to the question of what it is that law requires that we ask that question, that we try to address that question. It's not as if we could get a pre-theoretical um, metaphysical answer to it. It's part of the, you know how I like to talk about this, Thomas, it's part of the discursive challenge, right? Thank you, Jerry. It's a fascinating theme and um, perhaps in the next seminar, uh, I, I would have a question about salience in, uh, but I will leave it to our next meeting because okay. it's related to the, uh, to the other paper that you are going to present in the next seminar. So thank you for this. Uh, 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 so we have uh, two more questions in the chat. Can you read the question? Uh, so the first one is it's made by Ibrahim Rocha. Uh, I don't know to whom is, uh, is addressed, but the question is, do you think that the interpretation made by tribunals, courts, co courts yes, could be a, a historical true? And the dispute about the better interpretation is just to find a common sense to build a historical justice? It's the first question. The second question uh, is Dex 
existing legal framework in the US denies that general community access to participate participate in the discussion of how law is made and enforce it. Hence, Thomas' comments uh, resonate for anyone passionate about making our voice heard. Not a question, this is a commentary. So. Thank you, Thomas. Your microphone is off, Thomas. Uh, uh, anyone can answer the question. I think you already spoke too much, so there is another. Brian or Dennis and Jerry, you can go ahead. If not, I would have something to say too about the question. <laughs> I, 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 if Thomas, you have some idea what to make of the question, you're welcome to it. I mean, could be a historic true, um, build a historic justice. I, I, you know, part part of my chapter goes into some length, and some of my other recent writings go into some length about the complications of talking about truth and law. And once you then add in the adjective historic truth or historic justice, I'm not sure what work historic is doing there. Um, whether it's trying to emphasize it or, or undermine it. So, um, I mean, if you have a better notion of where the question is coming from, I defer to you. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll try to make a merchandise of the book here because <laughs> <laughs> the, we address the topic in the book. Uh, Jerry wrote extensively about uh, the, the historic historical aspects of the law, how he thought that legal re reasoning is historical, not only because it happens in history because it, it takes history as an ingredient of, of our judgment. I don't know how he puts it. He says something like uh, legal argument works in media has. I mean, in, in the meantime, there is a history before and a history ahead. So uh, you have to integrate everything into a historical narrative that makes sense. And when, when uh, th there is an idea that Jerry, um, writes about work in that I think it's it's very correct. It, it's very important. It's the dimension of regrets uh, in, um, in legal argumentation. I mean, sometimes uh, judges make mistakes, but you have to integrate these mistakes as historical facts and make a judgment about it. So uh, this is why legal reasoning is not exactly like uh, moral reasoning because you have to, uh, to regret some things and you have to, uh, and these, these mistakes and these decisions that you don't approve, they make an impact upon the content of the law. And I think that Jerry's uh, paper, uh, Integrity, Justice in Work Clothes, it's it, it's fantastic, and I think that and Barbara. Think it's it's a it's a shame that Barbara was not here because her hard. paper uh, discusses this topic in in length. Uh, it's it's wonderful. It's so if you like to if you if you like to read a very good answer uh, to this question, buy the book. It's there. <laughs> so that's <laughs> right. Right. Um, may I respond just to the other comment? I'm not sure exactly um, how to construe it. Um, it can go in a couple of different ways. Um, one of the worries I had um, coming away from the Protestant interpretation paper in 1997 was that it was still very court-centered. Um, and a lot of the subsequent, subsequent work that we were doing in legal philosophy at the time, whenever we talked about legal reasoning of any kind, it was very court-centered. Um, I have come later to recognize how important um, it is to decenter um, our thinking about law and its application. Um, so that in my work on, on rule of law, for example, it's really crucial that um, the parties that are holding accountable are not just other courts holding um, presidents or, well, that's impossible now, um, other administrative officials. Well, that doesn't look like it's working either, but um, not just courts holding other institutions accountable, but that it's some um, decentralized or um, 
devolved um, responsibility on members of the community um, to do that work as well. Um, that raises a big worry. Um, and that is, um, there's not access to the fora and the, and if you will, the raw data necessary to make that work. So that um, we've got a problem when, even when we're thinking about the rule of law and holding legal officials accountable, we got a problem not unlike the problem in democratic practice of there not being the, those who are supposed to be um, the root or the, the source from which um, power and decision-making comes don't have access to the resources they need to make um, um, reasonable, responsible contributions to the democratic process. Same thing goes, it seems to me, uh, when it comes to our thinking about the rule of law and practices of accountability. Access um, is extremely limited. And so we will have, um, I think, um, even in the best of circumstances, um, God knows that it's not true in the States right now. In the best of circumstances, we will not have a fully realized structure of accountability. Teaching good, teaching really smart students to be good lawyers is a start. You guys, I'm out of the business, but you're in it. Now, can I say something uh, more political here? Yeah, um, it's 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 uh, there is a uh, in this seminar series. Uh, there, there is going to be one coming in October with. Uh, Sadursky, Kim Lane Chappelle, uh, Renata Witz, and uh, Emilio from my law school, Emilio Mayer, my uh, deputy head of the Century of uh, Graduate Studies, and a good friend. We authored a few pieces together. And, and, and this very last uh, seminar is about the topic of what is judicial independence under illiberal governments. We yeah. don't we don't talk about illiberal states, but illiberal governments, and and there is uh, there is something in there uh, that is very connected to what Jerry was saying about the rule of law and what I think Dworkin was saying about Protestant interpretation, because what makes a, a government illiberal is the fact that it is a government that uh, tries to undermine public reason tries to make uh, uh, decisions made without judgment, without responsibility. And so they keep some sort of pollution in the air and people constantly um, mobilize to protect their most basic rights, their freedom of speech, their uh, dignity uh, or their academic freedom or, or their sexual rights that they don't realize all the other, other things that are going on in government. And so the, there is less and less control and less and less discourse, less and less accountability. And uh, citizens be, begin to be more um, uh, like sheep <laughs> uh, uh, conducted by an authority. And so they, they receive the orders without making judgment and taking themselves responsibility to interpret these orders. And I think that there is an important political reason why we should be Protestant interpreters. Uh, and especially uh, uh, if we want our government to be more liberal, to be more respectful, to be more egalitarian and, and the like. Yeah. Yeah, so I have um, written a piece about a year ago. It'll come out in Nomos soon. Um, the title of which is Failing Democracy. And the theme is a play on um, um, direct and indirect object. I guess that might be the way you put it. Um, and there's a lot of talk about democracy's failings, that there's democracies are failing around the country. And my point is in that paper, my point is that we got to think about how we are failing democracy, um, which this, again, 
it almost puts the responsibility back on us to do our thing. So maybe what that means is going on the bus and trying to convince people. I admire that. That's that's wonderful. Uh, very, thank you very much for these and these words too, Jerry. Uh, is there anything left to say? Perhaps we can. We are. Uh, we only have two or three minutes. Perhaps a little more. But uh... I just like to Okay, so uh, we, we come to the final uh, consideration. Perhaps uh, we can give the words to each of us so we can have uh, two or three minutes to close. Perhaps Brian, Dennis, uh, Jerry and I can have three minutes or two to give a final message, perhaps. Brian. Uh, I, I think I think the, the lesson of, the, uh, of our time together is that um, you should read everything Professor Postum has written, especially the you know, especially the most most recent stuff, and especially the review, the much earlier review of Dworkin. Um, and if you can add some background of Brandom and Wittgenstein and even Stanley Fish, that'll help too. Thank you, Brian. Dennis, you your final comments. Well, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, Brian and I and Jerry, we've been doing this for at least uh, three decades. We certainly lived through um, a lot of great things. I mean, I saw Ronnie when I was in graduate school. I mean, he was just absolutely astonishing. Uh, it's one of the best speakers I think uh, I've, I've ever seen. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the measure of his, of his presence, his thought is, you know, is the world a better place with him in it? I think it is. Now, I disagree with everything he says, but I think he is uh, an important thinker, somebody that uh, uh, should be paid attention to. And I disagree with um, my colleagues who think in a hundred years, his name will be forgotten. I think that is not gonna be the case, but unfortunately, None of us will be around to figure it out. <laughs> now, um, so where does the field go now? Uh, you know, we've had 30 years of the hard to work and debate. We've had inclusive positivism, exclusive. The RAS stuff seems to be running out of gas. All right, so where do we go next? So the current focus now is metasemantics and grounding. These are the topics that uh, are new to the field. And I ask my friends all the time, I said, so are you up on the grounding literature? And they say, no. I said, well, why not? And they said, because they're not going to read that stuff. Why are you not going to read it? Well, because I already have my views. Okay. But I think that grounding and metasemantics uh, really need um, to be given a lot more attention than um, I think we currently have. It's just a it, I think it's going to be really important. I think you have to have a point of view on it. And I think that uh, Jerry's work informs that. And I think if you, if you read it, uh, if you read what's going on in metasemantics and grounding now and ask the kinds of questions that he asks, I think it'll be very significant. Philosophy, the questions rarely change. The methodologies, the foci, they, they of course, you know, are different. But the, I think the fundamental disagreements are always largely metaphysical. I think this literature is important, not because I think it's correct, because I think it's really where the, uh, where the field of analytic philosophy is. And I think we need to be a part of it. And I think uh, over the course of my career, I've thought many times that philosophers of law just don't spend enough time reading what I like to refer to as real philosophy. And I think this stuff is important and people need to pay attention to it. Now, you know, Ronnie started his career with Gareth Evans. He started doing these seminars on the question of truth. And they were really important. They were formative to his thought. But, you know, the guy never took the time to learn the stuff. I mean, God almighty, he had Bill Ewald write the, write the end notes to Law's Empire. I mean, come on. Like, you just can't, you can't act like that. And people don't anymore. I mean, Ronnie could get away with it, but nobody can get away with it now. And I think that 
analytic philosophy is getting more and more professionalized. I think it's getting you know, more abstruse. But I, you know, I think that I think that that it's not a bad thing. It's just that's the next turn. And I hope that um, you know people remember that everything that Jerry's had to say about normativity, practice, and law are important to those debates. Those are my final comments. So may I just say a word here? Of course, you're next. I'm Thanks, next. Um, I think uh, Thomas and Brian, and especially Dennis, um, should get on their knees and ask for forgiveness for all the lies they've told about me this day. Um, you mean just this day, right? but I'm I'm very I'm very grateful, yeah, and and I will too, because I feel grateful for all their lies. Um, thank you very much. Um, that, as I said earlier on, that piece was a piece of, um, in a way, juvenilia, um, but um, I I am happy to see that it has given um, inspiration to. Um, you, Brian, and Dennis, and Thomas, and now a, few, a number of others, um, so that it's it's grown up on its own. Um, and um, of course, it can't be done. No one grows up. What do they say? You, you have, it takes a community to to raise a kid. Well, a community raised that one. Um, and I'm really grateful for your contributions here. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thanks. Uh, I should thank you very much. And I think that um, um, I would thank uh, Brian, uh, Dennis, and, and Jerry for this. It's, it's a real honor. And I think that um, over the past years, uh, since uh, 2007, when we decided to start this and we, we held the seminar on, uh, no, 2017, no, no, I think 2015, when we made that. Uh, I'm not sure, 15 or 17. Uh, we made a seminar on, on Jerry's work in Curitiba. Uh, I've learned a lot about Jerry's work. I, I had not read everything that I do, did now. And I, uh, it's fascinating how engaging with uh, Jerry's work just changed the way I see things. It's, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any other one uh, in jurisprudence nowadays that, that does uh, it with the kind of quality and, and uh, originality and passion that he does. It's in the historical sensitivity, the philosophical accuracy and the generosity that uh, characterizes Jerry's work is uh, impressive. And I think that every stu student should read his, his work. Um, it's, uh, so I, I thank you very much for this and it was, it was fantastic for me. And, and I hope that we carry on this conversation. I hope that uh, people uh, receive well the book, that we put a lot of effort in doing this. Let me just thank you a few people here. Um, I should thank uh, uh, Thiago de Car, who, who is there and co-authored, uh, co-edited the, the book with, with, with me on Jerry's work. A big thanks for him. And he wrote a brilliant paper on, on analogy and, and social practices uh, to discuss Jerry's work. It's, it's an impressive work. And I think that um, uh, uh, he has written other things about the working and Brandon and, and how they think can be connected has a big book in Portuguese, which is fantastic. I just regret that it is not in English, but he, there are some things in English coming up from him too. So you will get more familiar to his work, with his work. So I would like to thank Saulo, who is uh, co-organizing this similar series and uh, is very engaged with our activities and uh, he chaired today. So uh, I would thank uh, all of you for making this possible. It's, it's very, I would like to thank two other people who were there uh, in, in, in Curitiba and hosted the seminar on, on uh, Jerry's work, uh, Katia Kozicki and Vera Karan. They, they were here earlier. I'm not sure if they are still there. Uh, Vera was the first female uh, head of the 
law school of USPR, which is one of the best law schools in Brazil. And she, she just finished a fantastic job, probably the best uh, head of school they've ever had. And it's, it's very important for us. I also would like to thank uh, Ronaldo Macedo, who was there too, and he discussed it with me a lot about working in Wittgenstein. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, I had a fellowship at, at the University of Sao Paulo with him, and we, we've been there and taught a few course, courses together. Uh, much, about, much of what I learned from working came from there. Um, I would like to thank Margaret Martin, who now reads everything that I write <laughs> and is my confidant in legal philosophy, and she is going to edit, it, edit the book on, on the fish board, working debate with me. And I would like to thank my wife, because over the past three days, uh, she, she, she could stand me because I was very anxious and I, I was unbearable. And, and furthermore, she carefully listened to the argument that I was trying to produce. And she actually is the one who encouraged me to write this piece uh, that I just read for you today. If it were not for her, I wouldn't have written it. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I think that we can end this uh, with regret. Thank you very much. It was an honor. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patterson, Osema, Dix, and everyone that attended our first seminar. And you have, Thomas, you have your second seminar on? Uh, the second seminar will be, uh, I think, will be Margaret's uh, seminar. Yes, Margaret's. On yeah. Uh, 9th, I, I, September 9th. September 9th, that's it. And, uh, Yes. So we see With you there. Professor Margaret Martin. Yes. Thank you very much for all. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you all. Bye bye. See you. Stop recording. Stop recording. Stop transmitting on YouTube.